Good afternoon or good evening, wherever we are in the digital world, and welcome to our panel, uh, Digital Art and Feminism. I have two uh, of great practitioners with me today, and we'll be engaging in a kind of casual, casual conversation. My name is Véronique chagnon burke I'm an independent researcher. I'm interested in women, the founder of Women Digital Archives, of Women Arts Dealers, and um, I've been an educator also for over 20 years. So I hope I'll help uh, make some sense of what's going on in a digital uh, world now with the women artists. So first I'd like to ask uh, Sparrow to talk to us a little bit about your initiative, which is Waka, Women of Crypto Art, to tell us a little bit the story of origin so people understand um, how you felt that you needed to create such an institution and such an association. And tell us a little bit, a bit about all your hundred, nearly 200 members, I think you have. And then Monica, no. do the same thing. Yeah, it, it's grown um, quite a lot now. So there's a th over a thousand people on the oh, Discord wow. server. Um, not all of them women, because we are an inclusive community, um, but predominantly uh, women artists, who are either interested in crypto art or practitioners of crypto art. Um, we wanted to put together a community where women could um, connect with each other in the space because most of the interaction happens on Twitter. And it's really difficult to build those kind of connections with people um, in public on, on Twitter. So the way that WOCA started was um, me creating a Twitter DM group and adding in some of the women artists that I knew, who then added in more women artists that they knew, who then added in more. <laughs> um, and it quickly snowballed to the point where we hit the limit of the number of people you could have in a Twitter DM group. So we, that's when we created the Discord server to handle all of the other people who were interested in participating in this community. Um, since then, we've formed a DAO, we've done a, some collaboration artworks, um, we have organized a, a gallery in VR and held exhibitions. Um, and produced educational courses, launched a website. Um, we've done quite a lot since September of last year. So we haven't even been in existence for a year yet. Um, but I think it does provide for a balance and support of women in the space, being able to, to promote each other's work, being able to amplify each other so that in this really noisy space that is crypto art, women's voices can also be heard. Mm -hmm. I think it's one of the thread I think our conversation will have today is this need of building a community and either mm -hmm. and, and a community to kind of exist and empower artists themselves to uh, give more voices. And I think this is also one of the general change we've seen happening, not just in the digital sphere, but in, in all the spheres of the humanities and the art in general, there is much more horizontality rather than the verticality, which I think we all uh, are happy to. So Marnie, could you tell us a little bit um, how you came to create uh, AR artist and, and, and how you've developed your platform? And then I think we'll pick up on some themes that you both have in common. Sure, yes. So I'm a contemporary art curator and I focus on science and technology. And so science was a little bit in the beginning of my career, a little bit more and now I'm focused more on technology because of the innovations that are happening that are, you know, changing our everyday. And AI is 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 one of those. Um, so I and I've always been fascinated with how artists are um, you know, throughout history have sort of are so great at holding up a mirror to where we are and what um, kind of uh, subjects we're grappling with or you know um, decisions that we're grappling with as humans on a, on a maybe individual level, but mainly generally on a societal level. And I think a lot of the artists that are doing the work in, in AI and machine learning right now are, are, um, are 
giving sort of a, a spotlight on a lot of these things that, that we are that we're kind of trying to figure out uh, as we go. Um, so uh, I really wanted to develop a platform that would unite artists' voices within the context of this idea and history that artists really kind of bring a mirror um, to, to these things. Um, and I wanted a place for people who aren't artists, people who are artists and everything in between are just interested in AI in general to come to a space and learn a little bit more about it, learn about some of the cultural implications um, and societal implications, privacy, um, uh, you know, race and ethnicity mm -hmm. and discrimination, you know, myriads of, of, of things that this uh, technology is really, really highlighting, finance, loans, banking, that type of thing, um, policing, um, you know, all these things, facial recognition. Uh, and artists were doing it in a really, really compelling way. And uh, through the output of, of their artwork in different mediums, they were really able to uh, start an interesting conversation with people, kind of no matter whether you were in the arts or whether you weren't in the arts, um, you, you could understand a lot of, um, of, of these things that we're, that we're dealing with and um, uh, it, around AI and machine learning. Um, yeah, so that's why we started AI Artist. Org. Thanks. Uh, I think as, as someone who comes to your topic from more the uh, traditional gender and uh, traditional artistry and art market study kind of man, I realized that navigating both of your platform was, you know, very easy, very friendly. I also felt that there was a real uh, genuine effort to reach out to a wider community and to help educate us, the people that are not either practitioners or really familiar with it. And I thought this was a, a really interesting thing because it seems like in the uh, in a lot of the past time where there's new movement and, and, and interesting avant-garde time, um, avant-garde art movement, it stays very small and very in itself. And, and so I was wondering if both of you could uh, Tell me, maybe Sparrow first, what is your relationship with this kind of more traditional frame of feminist artistry and uh, inspirations? And how do you see even reaching out to the community outside of, of, of your domain and, and, and your landscape? I mean, that's a difficult question because <laughs> I think I have, I have two different, mm -hmm. almost conflicting um opinions and one is a personal opinion and the other is a a, a more considered opinion of representing a group of women and i think that there is a tension there um i'm conscious of so being a representative of a group of women artists I'm conscious of how often the traditional world or the world outside of us as a group um, pigeonholes or, or labels, right? Mm -hmm. So, oh, we'll just get someone from WOCA. And it doesn't, it, it, we lose our individuality in that group. And I think that that's a real issue because what we are, trying to do is amplify those individual voices, amplify those artistic um, expressions, which are innately individual and not homogenous. Mm -hmm. Every single artist in WOCA has their own individual voice. Exactly. And so it, it, you kind of want to make that space and you need to stand and, and hold that ground because if you cede that ground, you're going to be moving backwards. Mm -hmm. um, but on the other hand, you don't want to put yourself in an enclave either. Yeah. And so, there, you know, I, I find that tension and navigating that tension something that happens on a day to day basis in making decisions. I think you're, you're that, I mean, as an educator, I've faced the same issue. 
you you teach a woman artist class because there's a reason to do it but ultimately you want to tell your students that there would be a day where you don't have to teach a class like this and i understand that tension and moni have you've had uh, thoughts about this i mean in the way you select your artist or you invite them or you even think about your uh, your, your your curatorial projects Sure. I think that the most important thing is, is to be inclusive for, for us. So we really are trying to highlight um, underrepresented um, people that are working in this space. You know, it tends to be white men, um, you know, American white men, a kind of overall that are creating these technologies. And, you know, that's largely problematic because there's a lot of different people out there. And um, what happens is that, you know, these technologies are created with blind spots um, mm. because, uh, uh, you know, um, there's only sort of one um, perspective that, that that's shown. And then, you know, AI and machine learning is sort of everywhere now, but then you have, you, you know, you have, you have major problems like, um, like, uh, Joy Bulamwani did a really amazing um, piece called Ain't I a Woman? Um, and sh she highlights that, you know, facial recognition, we're, we're not recognizing um, uh, women of color and specifically black women. Um, and, uh, you know, it was like, it was saying that they were, you know, d different than, the, than they were, um, you know, so there's these, you know, if they had a, a black woman on the, on the team, um, then that that wouldn't have happened. Um, so that's like, in a, you know, that's an example, but there's so many examples of this, especially in, in the data sets that are just sort of like out there and being used now on a, on a large scale. So um, one of the things that I think is uh, really important and we try to do on our site is, is really invite people to start using this technology, um, you know, in a creative way, sure, but we try to do a lot of education on the website because if more people feel empowered to use the technology, then they can make the technology that works for them. So based on, mm -hmm. you know, their community, their background, you know, their, um, you know, what have you, ge geographical region, um, class, whatever, you know, what have you. So um, then it's much more inclusive. So we, mm -hmm. we, uh, we really try to do that. And that's some of like Stephanie Dinkins is an artist on our site as well. And she really likes to um, encourage people to do the same thing because we can, we can sort of um, really make something that's more reflective of, of, of reality. Yeah. And it's inclusive. Yeah, thanks, Marnie. And and I think leading on to that, um, Sparrow, what about, and obviously as a founder of, of Walker, you felt that there was a need for this and less space for women in, in the digital world. Uh, following up a little bit on Marnie's uh, comment, what, what, what do you think is, is, is there major issues? Do you think the women are faced the women artists in that world are faced with different issues that traditional that women artists who use paint and brushes and and, and other things or do you think um the relationship with the technology has made this even more difficult i think from an outsider world from someone who sees this from the outside we think about this world of of digital art as indeed being very male and even very male and very often very adolescent male with sometimes um, you know an iconography or use of imagery that is not something that uh, we would I mean caution or, or, or want to uh, to see too much. So are you how do you struggle with that tension or with the place of women in, in general in, in in that digital space? Yeah, it's really interesting to see the the breadth of work um, produced by women. Mm -hmm. um, that I I think I agree that the space is particularly more male focused than the traditional art world, um, simply because I think the vast majority of collectors of the mm -hmm. art are male and tend to support other male artists because mm. 
they're producing the things that those collectors want. Um, and I have seen some of the of women members of WOCA go down the path of producing those kinds of images because mm -hmm. that's what sells. And so to me, it's, it's the market forces and the broader societal forces mm -hmm. um, that really are the things that you need to push back against to fight for your own voice, to not bend to what the market mm. says it wants, but really stay true to yourself and, and, and produce the work that, that you want to produce as an artist. And I'm hoping that having a supportive group like WOCA enables women to feel more comfortable doing that. They will... I mean, one of the interesting part of your platform is that the, the, your members also have the agency themselves to basically transaction. And in a way, while we'll still know that in the traditional art world, validation comes through a certain numbers of steps, I think a question for both you and Marnie is that, do you think associations like yours, institutions like yours will be able to actually subvert and, and, and kind of disrupt that traditional art world market that has been quite disrupted already by the pandemic. And, and we see the blurring of the line between the private sales and what the galleries are doing and, and all kind of stand. And we see now more transparencies in prices, for instance. Do, so I think that would be an interesting things for our listener to, to, to know a little bit about is, is you think this is a, a, a good opportunity and, and that these women through your platform can have more agency or eventually you reach a kind of a plateau where then you need to reintegrate a more traditional, unfortunately male dominated, uh, dominated world. So I think we've already seen some of that. I think we have seen the marketplaces that exist in crypto art, particularly move, shift more towards the traditional art world mm -hmm. of patrons and, you know, yeah. big collectors and uh, catering to that top 1%. 1%. Toward, um, so unfortunately, I don't know, I'm sure we have disrupted the traditional art world somewhat by opening their eyes to the incredible things like um, tracking provenance automatically, mm -hmm. right? There, there's wonderful things that blockchain can provide for the art world. Um, but I think it's come at the expense of platforms becoming more like the traditional art world. Yes. Interesting, Mani. What, what what do you think? Sure. So of that our, and, and what we were talking about before. Yeah. No. I mean, I think it's such an interesting time. Um, I'll just speak to AI artists um, first. That, so mm -hmm. we're not a marketplace. So we're sort of more like an educational uh, component. Also, you know, philosophy. People are like really learning about you know these societal implications and <clears throat> able to talk about it you know, build a community, learn more about it, learn more about these artists that are doing these, you know, fantastic projects. And, and that's been really, um, like that, that's been great for, for us. We feel like, yes, you know, we're, we're, we're hitting the mark on the, on the, on the, the nail on the head on with that one. Um, but yes, I mean, I think in regards to sort of general, you know, how the art market is now, uh, you know, with crypto and with, you know, NFTs and I mean, all these things, it's, it's, it's a very interesting time. And I think art has always sort of been subversive, you know, land art of the 1960s and mm -hmm. 70s, you know, that was tough for galleries to figure out how to work with that. You know, it's some land art being, you know, spiral jetty, like, how do you get that in a gallery, you know, and how, <laughs> so, so it's, it's, it's really interesting. And I feel like art has sort of always been, that you know pushing the envelope um you know mirroring back what what we're sort of grappling with and you know our capitalist society in in the states so you know this is just a continuated you know continuing thing of that with with different technologies um which i find really exciting uh 
because I do think it brings it a little bit more um, into accessibility, even with, if people don't feel like they're like in the art world, like going into mm -hmm. a gallery may not feel that comfortable, but going on your computer, on a website and being able to browse like is, is more comfortable. Um, I think probably for most people, myself included, even though I go to galleries a lot, you know? So, yeah, right. um, and then one other thing I love is that it's really, um, I find that artists and buyer are a lot easier able to connect, which I think is just like so incredibly important um, for an artist and for a buyer. And it really helps sort of the appreciation of art. And also I think really helps an artist feel supported because they are able to have this relationship or at least a conversation with someone instead of having to like go through their gallery. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that 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 brings me to, to to the next point, which is that, you know, we see the capacity of, of, of that digital world of places like, um, you know, MoCA, WOCA and, and, and other uh, to change and to disrupt not just the art world, but also the art market. And um, in a way, we want to also keep in perspective that what you were talking about, Sparrow, before, which is that 1%, it is not the art world, and it's not the crypto art world, and it's not the digital art world, and we should actually always use art world with an S. So my hope, in, um, and this is something I see as, as, as a more of, a, of an art historian, is the fact that um, indeed, existing and, and producing work in, in the digital world allows us a much more utopian connection again with art. And I think I like the way you talked mm -hmm. about the fact that a lot of the women in, in, in digital art are thinking about healing, are thinking about the power of art as empowering in a different way than just a pretty picture to look at. Um, I, I, so mm -hmm. Can you maybe expand a little bit of this, this idea that in a, indeed you are creating uh, a, a new, I, I wouldn't say modernist because modernism is the reason why we are sometimes in that mess, uh, but a, a kind of a new alternative, not contraculture because we know that that doesn't also work either, but a new mm -hmm. space where things can evolve and exchange in a different way. And I think I, I, to Marnie's point, the fact that the collectors can talk directly to the artist, the fact that I can go, um, you know, in, in, a, in a crypto voxel and make myself an avatar, which was really much nicer than my own self uh, <laughs> and, and, and jump around and go into the gallery. I agree. It's much more accessible. So can you address this issue of, 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 this kind of community as an alternative to the 1% art world, which is, um, you know, not much about art and the power of art, but much more about the power of money. Money, yes. So I think you, you touched on one of my favorite quotes that is about, it, it's a world of many worlds, right? And, and the fact that with VR, like you mentioned, crypto voxels, we can create many worlds and have them play out our creative imagination, right? We are only limited by what we can imagine in these worlds. We don't have the same constraints as we have in the physical world. And that's very, very liberating um, for a lot of artists. And I think that's what is attractive about this this movement or this, this community, right? Is if you can imagine it, you're more than likely able to do it. There is that freedom that comes with anonymity in some cases and with the virtuality. So I see it as this, this huge opportunity to try and restructure things in a fairer way. I mean, if you look at just sales, right? You look at just money earned. I think there's there are only four women in the top 100 of in the top 100. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And and all of them are like already famous like Paris Hilton and Grimes and right. Mm -hmm. So how did we get there? 
Yeah. That is just a recreation of the traditional art world, right? Um, and that's that's the the big motivation behind something like WOCA is to, to try and change that. We have to work on getting women collectors, I think. Yeah. That's the problem to solve. And and do you have to also speak to the bigger institutions? What is the relationship with more traditional exhibition space or cultural institution, um, either mm. nonprofit that could like I would think a creative time that could help put something outside in a public space or even museums. How do you, um, I think that would also be a, a good question for Marnie. How do we break away from that community into a, a much larger community? Sure, yeah. So uh, one, one thing I love um, doing as a curator and even when I was sort of more science, more, more science-based is having shows that are at specific locations for specific reasons, whether that's, mm -hmm. um, you know, connecting communities or whether it's significant because, you know, in science, the data that was taken from the soil sample, for example, in an environmental show is the, right mm -hmm. on the mm -hmm. ground, you know, and it's outside, for example. Um, I love outside shows. They're so hard to do though. I mean, especially tech shows outside, oh boy. Um, but it's, it's the best outside because it's so many more people come uh, and especially if it's a more, a little bit more performative. So if it's at, you know, when people are, uh, you know, sort of generally off work, like on the weekends or at nights or, you know, their lunch hour or what, you know, what, what have you, um, you know, and having multiple times at multiple people, you know, different schedules can, can work with that, but um, just having something um, out there and, and free and, you know, interesting and uh, where people can really sort of under, uh, you know, see something that it attracts them. That's another thing as well as like you want diversifying the different mm -hmm. mediums that will be there so that, you know, if some people are a little bit more social, they might get on an interactive piece where they have to work with someone else to make it work or if someone's feeling a little light, like I don't want to talk to anybody, um, then, which is totally cool. Uh, and, and then they can go and find, you know, maybe they can listen to a sound piece or maybe they can like do, you know, follow like an, um, you know, a little a map uh, mm -hmm. that also has like digital elements along the way where they don't have to be so interactive. So um, I think it's important to think about your audience and, and where you do things and what will really resonate with people. And I think when you, when one does a show that comes to it from that space, it's much more um, accessible and inclusive and welcoming and interesting and, you know, all of the sort of amazing things that art mm -hmm. is. We, we, we have done, um, Woka hasn't, but I'm, I am aware that Dada Da, da, da Art, who, who is also in this Kadaf fair, mm -hmm. um, did a live drawing performance at Tate Modern um, late in 2019 before all the lockdown stuff happened. Um, and that's, you know, I think one of the first crypto art exhibitions I think at so. a major museum um and because it's it's it was made live you got you you have the performative part you have the engaging part of these hand-drawn images in a, a visual conversation um and more events like that that really capture people's imagination where they can see the art being created in front of their eyes effectively. Yeah. Um, really shows how individual artists are, how human artists are, mm -hmm. and how how you can connect to those artists in, in a way that sometimes is lacking with digital art. I think that's a really good point because I feel like the general public still has difficulty grasping 
uh, I think probably because of the problem of modernism telling us that, you know, the brush was the temperament of the artist and somehow the style, you could see it and stuff, um, are still as, as, as difficulty understanding, you know, how to appreciate it, how to think about it. And, and, and as much as great it is to be able to go and navigate all the different platform and see a lot of digital art on the screen, you don't have a mediator with you. You're just left alone. And I know Yes. that a lot of people don't want to trust themselves. So, um, you know, unfortunately, time is going to wrap up pretty soon. But I wanted to go back to the question of uh, this this recent, this recent, re recent buzz around cryptocurrency. And I know that we are addressing ourselves to an audience of people that are already in the know. But um, how do you think you can maintain calm, sustainability, uh, freedom to develop voices and individual voices and resist. I mean, you, 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 Sparrow, talked a little bit about how some of the artists you feel are, are not resisting enough, but how can you continue both in your respectable field to, to resist this, to continue to kind of develop a field that is not going to become a bubble? I think that's developing the person on, you know, alongside the development of artistic skills. So you have to build that confidence in yourself to be able to know what it is that you want to say. And once you know what you want to say, I haven't met an artist yet that will compromise on that. It is just the initial building up of that confidence to know what your voice is. Um, and that's what you can do by building a community, because mm. that community helps you build the person as well as the skills. No, I think that's a, Mani, what, what do you think when you, you're working with a wide range of artists? And Yes, yes. I think, um, again, this sort of many, many different narratives, like find an artist finding their voice and finding, you know, and finding your voice, but sometimes it's just, I'll, you do a lot of work, you know, to figure out what that is, or you think that you know, and then it changes, and you know, and what have you. But um, as far as you know, with AI, machine learning, I think it's really important to be, you know, sort of extremely um, inclusive with that. So we have a lot of um, different you know, interpretations of this of this technology, and um, and I, I, you know. So just so that, you know, again, sort of everything's at least out there or accessible. And that's something that we try to do on our platform. And it's something that a curator's role is. And this is something that is interesting in this sort of digital art world. It's some things are curated, some things aren't curated, some things are curated by people who like, you know, maybe they don't, don't exactly know how to curate. Some are curated by, you know, people who, who really know, but you know, again, being a curator, I'm like, well, you know, there is a, there is a benefit to someone who has sort of trained on all the considerations that I sort of was, was mentioning about, you know, when, when you're dealing with something like AI and machine learning and inclusivity and what's that narrative and what's that art historical narrative, you know, we, we, mm -hmm. we have a very skewed art historical narrative as of now. And I'm, <laughs> I'm hoping these technologies really help change that and that it is a mm -hmm. much more inclusive narrative as it, as it should be. Um, so, you know, I think that's that's important and that's why it's it's nice to have a curator but I, I realize also that you know we're also talking about breaking down you know the galleries and the museum walls and like really you know being it so that's just something that's going to happen you know we having you know maybe not a curated show online I mean that's going to happen and, and that's okay too you know sort of we'll we'll things will you know go as they as they do it's okay because I think the greater benefit of just at least having um, pieces or works or perspectives and narratives and that are out there is really the important yeah. element. Yeah, I having things out there. Oh, sorry, yeah. sorry, go ahead, Sparrow, go ahead. I was just gonna say having things out there is something that, that I found. So, I mean, I didn't do digital art until I came to blockchain. I did encaustic wax painting. Right, so I was dealing with really physical mediums. 
um, traditional technique too. <laughs> and yeah. a very traditional technique, yes. <laughs> and, and so, you know, the idea that artists who are just starting out now can have their entire development as an artist documented on the blockchain. Yeah. So, all, I mean, all of my digital work is documented, tokenized on the blockchain. So you can see my development in digital medium from the time that I started until now, it, it's all there for a curator or whoever to pick out and, and find those narratives, mm -hmm. right? So the mm -hmm. fact that it's out there, like Marnie said, yeah is just going to change that, you know, you're not gonna have attics full of paintings that have never been seen. Mm -hmm. It's all gonna be out there. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think that's that's excellent. And, and in a way, what you do is you give, um, you, get, you give a lot of power to people like me, the art historian, we're gonna have to sort, not me, but my next, the next generation was going to have to sort all that. I think the importance is having everything out there and, and mm -hmm. developing, you're right, the artist rather than the market and finding kind of a way to find a balance, but not to lose uh, the fact that, you know, uh, the digital art world is opened these possibilities of disrupting and, and changing and, and, and in a very efficient way. But there's also needed to resist and think and, and, and do this, which artists do anyway, as Marnie said. Uh, but you're right, things need to be out there, which is uh, uh, really essential. And then let people judge and, 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 and decide. And I think, you know, and, and give as an educator, I feel like people should be given the power to know that they are making choices that are fine. And, and sometimes there is this intimidation that we talk about, the more traditional art world, the barrier of the museum, when you step up the, 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 you know, the grand staircase, or, mm -hmm. or as you said, the gallerina at the beginning, uh, you know, at the entrance of the gallery, and that doesn't happen. So we need to keep this kind of a, a vivid part of, of that world, which will be able to maybe change things on the long term. Um, very quickly, after the pandemic in five years, where are you going to be Sparrow? And when are you going to be Marnie? And how we are going to still engage with you and all these great questions? Do I go first? Do you wanna go first? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> in, in, in five years time, um, I'm going to be living more fully the invisible economy, which is something da 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 art has been working yep. on um, for the last year yep. through the pandemic. Yeah, and I think Sparrow, that's also a really interesting uh, uh, aspect of, of that kind of art and being in that is, is the capacity to actually, you know, be in a different, uh, a different, use a different economy, navigate the world in a different way, the power that it gives. And, and I think the power that the blockchain technology gives to the artist is also something that, for me is one of the major takeaway. Um, so thanks for sharing that with us. Marnie, where are you going to be? <laughs> yes, great question. Um, well, I'll, well I'll what do you to, hope for your organization? Yeah, I can speak to that, but easier than, than myself. So. Yes. Um, so yeah, I mean, we, we would we would love more more traffic on the site. Right now, we get on average about forty thousand people a month, which is great. But we want to just bring more people if they're interested in machine learning or AI or artists that are doing this work, or maybe they want to dabble in it too, or kind of understand a little bit, you know, more about it. Um, we would love to have more visibility for underrepresented artists in this field. Um, so women, you know, I mean, the whole, there's so many underrepresented, um, as we kind of talked about earlier. Um, and then, um, you know, the the philosophy piece has been really interesting for for us. Like, you know, what what does it mean when we're using these technologies at, you know, such a scale? And um, what do we do with that? And I'm I'm thinking, you know, we don't have any answers. So don't go on the site looking for answers <laughs> necessarily, but we I think at least, I mean, in a lot of I mean, good art generally 
doesn't really, you know, it, you have more questions when you leave or, or mm, thought so pieces true. or, you know, you have a conversation or a perspective that you didn't think about or, you know, something you're left with more questions and, you know, the world's a complex place. And I think it's, it, you know, it, it will, you know, will continue to develop, you know, as, as, you know, as humans do and we'll continue to have more questions and, and hopefully explore these on, on the site and the philosophy so we can be a little bit more proactive of, of what we want to create for humanity in in the future uh instead of like reactive where it's like oh no mm -hmm. the technology is doing this that's not good you know so yeah. i think that would be I great think, for us i think what what i'd like people to take away from our conversation is um obviously the power of heart to transform and empower people but also the power to question the world and question the role of technology surveillance how we track ourselves how we're being tracked uh, but also remembering that uh, uh blockchain is giving autonomy to the artist and their capacity yeah. to be to, to maybe disrupt what has been going on especially in the top of the art world i want to uh, thank sparrow who is the founder of woka woman of crypto art and marnie uh, the founder of ai art artist and hopefully all of you know how to find these two people on the internet but i encourage you really to check their websites and uh, to our next conversation thank you a lot and good luck with your project and uh, i'll keep navigating your sites and uh, think about the greatness of art thank you so much thank, thank you so thank much you. thank bye -bye. you bye bye, bye.